so much has been written about um, the Gettysburg Address that it almost, and, and people have memorized it so much that they almost don't even know what it means anymore. Uh, you ever sit down with somebody and ask them to recite something that they know by heart and then ask them to tell you what it means and they can't do it? It's almost as though we know it so well we don't know it, uh, if that makes any sense to you. Kind of like um, maybe a prayer that you know ver by heart and you don't really think very much about what it means like you should. Or the Pledge of Allegiance. I once had a conversation with a lady and said that the Pledge of Allegiance is an oath of political loyalty, and I understood why some parents might think that it was inappropriate for children to recite it. After all, like I said, it's a, it's a political loyalty oath. And this lady just adamantly just screamed and pounded on the table and said that's just that's a that's a damnable lie it's not a political loyalty oath it's the pledge of allegiance and i said what does allegiance mean and she says uh, the being faithful to someone yes otherwise known as being loyal um, and look at the look at the opening lines of it i pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, meaning I will be politically loyal to the flag and to the republic known as the United States of America. I hereby pledge my political allegiance to that institution. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. I just wanted to make the point that we frequently uh, sort of say things, recite things, without really thinking about what they are. And, you know, if you do think about what, what it is and you have conscientious objections to doing that or having your children do it, well, I, don't, I can't blame somebody for that. Well, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is kind of like that in that we know it so well because so many, well, maybe we don't anymore in this age of cultural illiteracy, but one would hope that most high school graduates or college graduates know it, at least in passing, um, that we know it so well that we don't know it anymore. And so I want to kind of, first of all, sort of dispel some of the myths and frankly outright lies about the, the address. Um, uh, of course, the Battle of Gettysburg uh, happened on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 1863 in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. You know, Lee on the one side and uh, General Meade on the northern side. Uh, Lee thought that if he carried the campaign up north and waged war up there and uh, terrorized the countryside and romped around and did some destruction, that the north would eventually get sick of the war and let him go. You know, there were a lot of people who said we shouldn't really be at, at war with these folks anyway. Lincoln uh, in uh, 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 62, early 63, uh, had come out with the Emancipation Proclamation, which said very, very uh, uh, specifically here that as of January 1, 1863, any state that was currently at that time in rebellion against the United States federal government, its slaves in those states will be freed. And he did it kind of on this theory that they're considered contraband of war. Right? Because the South's using them as an instrument of war, and we will basically confiscate them. From that point on, freed Southern uh, African Americans were nicknamed contraband. Um, so you would hear them talking about oh, contraband this, we ran into some contrabands. What they mean is these were people who were emancipated by the Emancipation Proclamation uh, post January 1, 1863, uh, by the Emancipation Proclamation itself giving the federal government the authority to say these are this is confiscated because what they were doing is a clever little argument there what the the argument was is oh so you think they're property well good we'll confiscate the, your property in quotation marks uh, because you're using this so-called property as a war implement against us we'll confiscate it by golly, uh, <laughs> you know, spoils of war, too bad. Um, and so, of course, this infuriates the South. It also infuriates a lot of people up north who did not want the war, in their eyes, to be turned into a war against slavery. They said, I didn't sign up to, to free the slaves. I say, signed up to save the Union, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, in retrospect, we all know what that meant. Saving the Union meant saving human rights, political rights, the rights of the Constitution for everybody. But by 1863, Gettysburg, this tremendous loss for the South, a real turning point in the war, um, it had gone on for a long time, and thousands of young men had died. And so this is the point at which the crisis of the preservation of the Union was taking place. Everyone wanted to know, are we going to make it? Are we going to? It looks like we may have turned a corner here, but how much longer is this thing going to go on? How many more young men have to die as a result of all of this? Well, after the war, I mean, after the battle, um, which, like I said, ironically, the last day of the battle was July 3rd. Uh, 
Robert E. Lee and on the evening of July 3rd, morning of July 4th, skedaddled back to Virginia never to invade the North again, and it was a triumph for the North, an unexploited one. They could have chased him and probably ended the war early. Lincoln was furious about it. Um, but the fact of the matter was that it was a Northern victory. But thousands died. Many more thousands were wounded, and uh, the casualties were just, uh, you know, just made your head spin. There was a national cemetery dedicated there. They decided to take all of the war uh, uh, dead from the battles, uh, the battlefield dead, and bury them there at the national cemetery that they created. And this speech was given as a dedication to of the of the national cemetery in November of that year. The first person that was really invited to speak was Edward Everett, a very famous orator and statesman. Uh, he was the one who was the keynote speaker. Lincoln was actually invited kind of as an afterthought, <laughs> believe it or not. Prior to the Civil War, the presidency was considered almost an honorary position. It's kind of weird because today we think of the president as having a lot of power, but prior to the Civil War, it was Congress that had all the power, and the president was kind of this ribbon-cutting guy. He signed and vetoed stuff. Yes, that's true, and he had some power, but he was nowhere near as powerful. That's what that's what Lincoln and the, and the Civil War did to the office of the presidency. It gave it tremendous power. Um, it greatly enhanced the power of the executive branch. Um, but it's it, it's surprising to us that Lincoln was sort of oh yeah let's invite the president. It would uh, we we better do that because you know he might get offended if we don't. Let's have him say a few words. Everett's speech went on for two hours. Lincoln's speech was a couple of minutes long, as you can see. It was quite brief, and when he gave it, in fact, if you look at the slide there in the lower right hand, that is one of the only that's the only authentic photo that we have. There are a couple that are alleged that we think may have been him, but it's actually, if you look at him, he's sitting down. The speech is over by the time the cameraman actually gets the shot off. Um, the cameraman thought the speech was going to be a lot longer. He had plenty of time to set up, and, you know, it took exposure time, took a while at the time. Um, and so he thought he had tons of time, and he barely got a photo of him. Um, but as he sat down, he said um, to one of his advisors, he said, that, that, that speech won't go over very well. Nobody's going to like that very well. But when we look at it, and if you look at it carefully, it is, I think, in my estimation, the greatest speech ever delivered by an American. It really is a prose poem. It's a, an astonishing piece. Let's look at it together and try to explore it as we go through it, looking at the structure of the piece and realizing that it's such a complex piece and such a profound and deep piece. People have written books on it. I encourage you to read the book uh, Lincoln at Gettysburg by Gary Wills. It's a tremendous work. It talks about religious rhetoric and all kinds of things that went into the making of the speech. It's a myth that he wrote it on the back of an envelope on a railroad train. He spent a lot of time thinking this, this piece through. There's evidence that he has tried to start writing the piece at least two weeks in advance. So all of that is just chopped down the cherry tree kind of baloney and malarkey that comes through uh, the myth of the country. Uh, let's take a look at it. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Notice the use of biblical rhetoric. It was already archaic to say score this and a score of that, etc. People in the 19th century didn't say score. They said 20. That's what score means. Where, are they get, where is he getting this language? Straight out of the King James Bible. Four score and seven years ago. Sounds very biblical, doesn't it? Um, our fathers, right? Patriarchs. Patriarchs, our forefathers, the, the fathers, the Old Testament fathers, right? Um, so he's really utilizing this, and this is my spin on it a little bit, utilizing religious rhetoric in order to get the audience to begin to see the war and the nation in a new light. He sets the tone even in that opening passage. Notice that the opening paragraph is about the past. The middle paragraph is about the present. The third paragraph is about the future. Which paragraph is the shortest? Which paragraph is the longest? The longest paragraph is the last paragraph where he talks about the prospects of the nation going forward. But let's look at the second paragraph. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether the nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. This is what he's saying. And you've got to give Lincoln credit. Obviously, I'm very biased. I think Lincoln was the greatest president that ever lived, partly because he... he ran for re-election during a civil war and won. 
and said, I'm not going to declare martial law. I'm not going to postpone the election. The question at hand is this. Once you've created a democracy, can it survive its own internal struggles? Can it survive? Because everybody in Europe says, yes, sure, yeah, you're, you can, you know, democracy, republic. Everybody knows they don't last. Um, only monarchies last. You have to have a strong central government with a dictator, or you can't, you can't survive as a nation in the world. And so Lincoln says, this is a great, huge experiment. It's an 87-year-old experiment. And if we betray the principles upon which we founded the nation, then we failed the experiment. We are asking this great question, can democracy survive itself? And so he goes on to say, we are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that this nation might live. Look at that. They gave their lives that this nation might live. Keep that squirreled away in the back of your mind. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow, hallow this ground. Look at the threes, 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 all through this piece. Threes in his, his sentences, repetition of phrases and clauses, three paragraphs before um, uh, the war, now, the future, all of this. There's a trinity structure to this piece. It's really interesting. They died so that we would live. Watch carefully. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Look at the beauty of the rhetoric there. Little note, long, uh, long remember what we say, what they did. Look at the contrasting here, the balanced phrases. It's marvelous stuff. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here, ha, here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be, dedicate, to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Now, Again, let's examine the rhetoric of this because it's so fascinating and so rich. You could go on forever. Books have been written by it and we don't, about it, and we don't have time for that. But look, the soldiers died. They sacrificed. They have become immortalized through that sacrifice. They died for us in our place. They died, if you will, for our sins. Do you see this? He's not being blasphemous, I don't think, but he sure is echoing this kind of Christological, sacrificial thing. The soldiers have been Christ-like in dying for us, and we, like the apostles after Christ, have got to go on with the great commission of spreading the, not gospel, but the gospel of democracy throughout history. We have to take this death, their death, and we have to immortalize them by making sure they did not die in vain. Everywhere you hear Paul, for example, in the epistles talking about Christ's sacrifice, we, it, it don't, don't allow Christ's sacrifice to be in vain. We have an obligation as those who are to spread the gospel, to, to go out into the world, the Great Commission. And Lincoln is giving us a great political commission. He's inspiring us to go and do what the apostles did, what the disciples did, to go out into the world and not only make sure that these men did not die in vain, but to make sure that this government, look at the Trinity here, of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. It needs to be reborn. He's asking for the country to think this war is about being born again as a country. 
That is really something. They never teach you this in high school. I know they never go into this step, but it is really amazing the level and depth of thought. And he is really pulling on and using religious rhetoric, the rhetoric of the pulpit, the sort of Protestant evangelical kinds of ways of hitting all the buttons, ringing all the bells that he can with the audience that he knows is deeply steeped in religious upbringing. It was a deeply religious time, and so he frames it in religious rhetoric. And to say that they're going to live on because of what we do is really important. He's not trying, I think, to be blasphemous here. He's trying to echo and say, look, like Jesus, these people died for us. We can't let them die for nothing. You know, we're too, we're in it too deep right now. We cannot quit. We can't quit. You say, well, let's just quit and go home. No, they're too, don't let them die in vain. Every one of these gravestones is a guy who died for something that we have got to see through or they will have died for nothing. Don't let that happen. A tremendously deep, powerful, and profound and moving piece that people just don't give Lincoln credit for. They, the, the rail splitter Lincoln is too deeply ingrained in our mind. This man was a natural genius. I think there are a few people who were natural geniuses in, in the world. I think um, uh, Martin Luther King was. I think Benjamin Franklin. I think uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I think uh, that Frederick Douglass was. These are people who just were born brilliant. And there was nothing that their circumstances growing up would, could have done to stunt their brilliance from eventually emerging. Uh, and I think Lincoln was one of them. People don't give him credit for that. In the next uh, slide, we'll look at the second inaugural, a piece that I think is even more neglected and more misunderstood.